So I guess we can start, right? So, hi. Just to confirm, is there anybody who does not speak Czech? Yeah, so English it is. So, first of all, I have to remind you that in order to win the prize, you have to get your QR code uh, confirmed by the newsstand. That's just some information I had to pass. So, now, to functional programming. So, first of all, who has heard of functional programming before? Great. And who claims himself to be a functional programmer? <coughs> That's great. <laughs> Not many of you. <clears throat> so, first to introduce myself. My name is Peppa. Um, just another guy with GitHub and Twitter that goes well together, right? Uh, I study at MathFace and I work at News, where we consider ourselves functional programmers. And why should I even talk about C Sharp, like in .NET uh, context when we have F Sharp, right? So, as you all know, there is not a lot of programmers on market. It's really hard to find programmers, and especially programmers in languages like Scala, F Sharp, Haskell, there is not many of them. And if you want to scale your team, you have to have a lot of developers, so having them uh, find them is like a challenging task for such languages. So C Sharp is like a really known <coughs> language, and actually a lot of code bases are already written in C Sharp, they are quite big, and you cannot just scratch them and write, write them to F Sharp completely. And this talk is about a lot of concepts that you can introduce to your existing code base and like really roll out them throughout the whole system. So, what it is actually is the functional programming. It's pretty hard to like define what is actually functional programming, object-oriented programming, but functional programming is known for a lot of these weird words. <laughs> and I will start with one, actually two words, and it's called referential transparency. That's basically the base of functional programming. That's the main idea. And in English, it means that whenever you have a function that, for example, for a given input 5 returns a 10, these two lines are equivalent. That means that the function does not do anything else besides returning the input to the caller. It does not mutate anything. It doesn't change the state anything in any way. So you can really replace this call within your code so with, the, with the output of the function. And these functions are called pure functions, as you <coughs> probably know. Uh, so, yeah. so why do we want that? Why referential transparency is a thing? Why is something that we would like to have in our core basis? And there is a lot of them. There is a lot of benefits to it. The main one is there are no surprises, right? Like, the function just returns you some data. It cannot do anything else. So you are not surprised what the function does. How many times have you <laughs> debugged a bug where you, were, you would like be, oh, I did not guess this function does this or, or that, or it says email, it saves to the database. You did not expect that. I saw like many of these bugs, <laughs> and this would eliminate them. Another thing is testability. Like, if the function only takes an input and returns an output, it's pretty easy to test, right? You just pass it some input and test that the output is right. Then it's super easy to like reason about these functions because there is no like state factor involved. Whenever you reason about the code, you usually have to reason about the state the application is in to know how it behaves. But this like con this has no like time factor. It only just takes parameters where it is an output. In this context, functions can be viewed as basically tables of mapping. They map the input to output. So it's basically a dictionary from like <coughs> input to output. Then they are pretty easy to parallelize because the main issue with like parallelization is that when they touch the same data, these, function, these functions don't, do not. And they are pretty easy to cache because they will always return the same thing. You can pretty safely cache them, right? So we do want this in our application. And so what is the difference between like 
object-oriented programming and functional programming. Are these contrary to each other or not? So, first of all, we would have to define object-oriented programming, which is harder. And some, of, some people see object-oriented programming basically as polymorphism, that you have objects and polymorphism, but it's hard. So, I'll be talking about a lot of concepts and techniques, and they can be also used within object-oriented world. You don't need to use them like with the functional programming. You don't have to go all the way to like the FP heaven or something. You, you can really just, even one concept. If you go away from this talk and you will use just one concept, that's enough for me. And uh, the thing about the concept is that they go align with the functional programming. They are really not, rec you, you don't need to have the functional programming to apply them. So let's see those commonly used with FP. Uh, and before that, let's take a look at the C Sharp as a functional language. If it actually supports enough things for us to apply this technique in C Sharp, and it does. So we have like functions as variables, like we have delegates, we have lambda functions, so we can pass functions around, we can store them to variables, we can do such things. Then we have link queue, which is actually like very advanced FP technique. Just many C Sharp programmers don't know about it. We have this collection just immutable, which is like uh, support for immutable collections in .NET. And then in the new C Sharp, we also have the switch expression, which is basically a pattern matching. I'll talk about that later. So we do have enough like tooling to make this work. So let's make it work. <coughs> but C Sharp lacks something. So we need to add those things we lack to C Sharp, and the only way to do it, except for forking C Sharp and <laughs> extending it by ourselves, which is <laughs> not a good idea, we have to add them via library. So there are many libraries which add like FP stuff to C Sharp. These are two of them. The most well known is language extensions. Who actually knows language extensions? Okay, so it's not that famous. <laughs> But in the FP world, it's really famous. It's super huge. It's written by a guy who is like really advanced in Haskell. So actually using this library does not really ease something for you because the learning curve, learning curve of the library is almost the same as Haskell one. So that's why <coughs> I will be talking about library called Functia. That's a library that was written by our CTO. <coughs> And from time to time, I also add some things. And <coughs> these concepts, sorry, <coughs> are implemented via the library. This library is pretty lightweight. It <coughs> doesn't have many, <coughs> sorry, I had a rough lunch. <laughs> and so it does not add a lot of things. It basically just extends C Sharp. Even though language extensions are called language extensions, they replace C Sharp for something else. But Fun Sharp is more like a language extension in that manner. So let's see these concepts, techniques, and patterns we can use uh, within C Sharp. <coughs> so the first of all is expressions versus statements. So this is like somewhat a typical code you would see in, let's say, now more legacy uh, parts of the code, but this is just an ordinary statement. You have the result. If something you store something to the result, if something else you store that, and this is a statement. Like almost everybody would rewrite immediately to this, right? Am I correct? So this is an expression. This is a ternary operator in C sharp. And the difference between those two codes is that the first one was like the structure itself was not returning a value. This does. The statement was some like construction what to do when and when to store it. But this expression returns a value. You can, in if, you can do something mutable. You can do something else. You can just call it console.read line. You cannot do console. Uh, sorry, write line. You cannot really do console.write line within the, within the ternary operator. And, <coughs> great. And so, there is really this difference between expressions over statements. So statements don't return values. 
they usually mutate stuff and they are hard to compose. If, if they don't return value, they are hard to compose within each other. So you can have multiple ternary operators nested in each other, but nested statums, as you know, is like, are pretty hell. So, <clears throat> so we were able to solve the if example with the ternary operator. But how would you solve this? This is like a try catch. That's a statement. And there is no other like uh, language building support for try catch as an expression. So <coughs> we want to get rid of this. And let's do it. We'll do it later in the talk. First, let's view immutability. So also, you can have immutable objects in object-oriented programming. Actually, in our class to C Sharp on university, the best practice was to make objects immutable by default. And it was heavily object-oriented. So this is like a really good practice. A lot of things are immutable. Strings in .NET are immutable. Git is immutable. It's like a general, general uh, concept, but it really goes in line with FP because in FP we cannot mutate stuff. We can just return it because if the function would mutate anything, it's not pure. So that's why we talk about it a lot. <coughs> and this is the common problem I've talked about. You have the some person class, and then you have the pr printer for the person, right? And if you pass the person, how do you guarantee that the function does not mutate the person? I know it would be a silly implementation, but you have no way to guarantee it. And this is just an example, but in the real world, we do actually have classes in our code that look like they don't do anything, but they do. So we want to get rid of that. And uh, what's also great about immutability is that you can share this, like, the, as I said before, in the with the parallelization, there is a problem that if you try to mutate the same like address in memory with, with two threads, it can cause race conditions, stuff like that. If you don't mutate stuff, there are no race conditions, right? So usually in the FP world, you just create new stuff out of the previous ones and maybe at the end replace it in the memory with some like compare and swap or something like that. But the great thing also is that a lot of people view immutability as like a memory trade-off or performance trade-off. That like I have to copy uh, like the whole class to create it new. That's not how it works. Usually with immutable data structures. So what's great about immutability is that it's immutable. So you know that if you have a pointer to something, it won't never ever change. And you can use that information. And people do use that. So if you have a list of five numbers and you, want, you say that you want a new list with one number at the end, you can reuse the original list because you know it will never ever change. And this is actually used a lot. Uh, this is usually called persistent data structures where they like reuse it. Basically Git is also a persistent data structure. And uh, so it's actually even faster. How many times have you tried to do a deep copy of an object just to make sure that nobody else touches it, right? A lot of times. And the deep copy is actually pretty expensive opposed to just adding like a div basically of those two data structures. So this is how we would write uh, like a, this is how we write C sharp classes by default, basically that you have only getters, right? Uh, this particular class, of course, does not use the structure sharing, but if this will be your performance issue, like the main per performance issue in your project, like you are happy. And so, basically, let's say we have the we have the class. It has a name and email, and nobody can change it as long as the person name and mail address is also immutable, right? And the way how we would change it, we would call the with email method with the new email address and would create a whole another person. And now, <clears throat> algebraic data type. This is another really scary word for a pretty simple thing. And this is basically the main topic in the whole talk. This is like really essential for functional programming <coughs> or as a concept in general. 
So a lot of object-oriented programmers say composition over inheritance. That's pretty surprising, opposed to that a lot of uh, OP languages actually have inheritance. And like, as you all know, inheritance is somewhat bad. It creates these like large uh, hierarchies that are super hard to get right. And so algebraic data types are basically composable types. There are two of them, product and coproduct. You know one, product is another word for a tuple. You probably don't know the other. But what's great about them is that just with these two types, you can model any type possible. <coughs> Basically, a product is like an analog analogy to AND, and coproduct is like an analogy to OR type. So let's view them. So product is really just another uh, like word for an array tuple. You say you have int and another int. So you have two things. It like breaks them together. It's just a record. You don't even have to use the products. You can just use tuples. It's the same. And what's actually interesting that it's word using like yeah, the library is uh, written in a way that is basically generated for like 16 overalls, everything. And so we have like the product two, product three, product everything. And it's actually useful to you product one. It's great for type aliasing. So if you have like uh, something that you basically is a string, but you just want to wrap it and have the structure, structure comparison and everything, this is great to use. More new, for you, I guess, will be the coproduct. So let's say you have this class. This is called a paragraph reader. And it reads paragraphs in some way. But what is the return type of the read method? In C sharp, we, for example, have like the classic reader. And it returns an integer. It reads characters. And in the end, it returns minus 1. How should I know that? I have to read documentation or comments. And we all know how it ends if you just rely on comments and stuff like that. <coughs> so what is the return type? And what if there are more information like what is what if you want to be notified about paragraph end, the end of the whole file, and the paragraph line itself? Like it should probably return a string, and when it's now you are like, yeah, it's end. Yeah, but now it also has to notify us about something other. And that's where coproducts are to SU. So <clears throat> coproducts is something that's also called discriminated union or union types, or sometimes even some types. <coughs> and they really have the semantics of all these things. They are like, it's this, or this, or something else. So the way how you write them with functchar is, let's say you have the reader result, and it's either a line, or it's a paragraph end, or it's a document end. And it's like nice to encode it in the types itself, what it actually returns. You can really think of it as a non-extensible single-level inheritance in one place. Basically, the reader result can be viewed as an abstract class, and line, paragraph end, and document as subclasses of it that are sealed, and you cannot extend it. So. It's great that they, you cannot extend them to multiple levels and everything. They force composition. And since it's this like really concise, it's uh, pretty easy to uh, write them, as opposed to writing the, literally the class and all the subclasses. That would be like, you wouldn't probably do that. And what's great is that uh, in order to have some function which takes a read result and does something with it and has some common like functionality for all the subtypes, you usually uh, introduce uh, virtual methods that you are like, yeah, I will, I will be forced to implement or abstract methods. You will, will be forced to implement it for every subtype. But what if you need to do something like IO? You cannot really have a dependency injection within the class itself or something like that. At least it's not nice. So, and also you have to bloat the class with every functionality you need to have, like similar to all those subtypes. 
So what's great about this is that you just create a function <coughs> and you pattern match on the type. So pattern matching is something like regex on objects or like really advanced switch. Now, I don't have to say advanced anymore because, yeah, let's say advanced, but the switch expression is C-sharp 8 is pretty good. So it takes some object and you have like, if the pattern is this, then do this. If the pattern is something else, you do something else. So for example, with the top, you have like, if the first is five, I'll do this. If the second is 12, I'll do this. And it's really used. So why is it more useful within FP context than the object-oriented context? Is that, that since things don't change, they are stay the same way. So they basically remember even how they were created. Then you can match the pattern like more safely. And it's really used a lot, especially on lists and stuff like that. So the, the reader or the cup product on it has a fit, like a function called match, uh, which basically does this. If you, it will give you, it have like, for the coproduct of three, it have three parameters, the functions that take line, paragraph, end, and end. And you like nicely implement it like this. So you just like extending functionality for a given type is very easy. And then if you, if you add a new type that you change the coproduct three to coproduct four, this won't compile. You will have to go here and implement the last function for the new type you added. So that's pretty great. And this is one of the concepts that you haven't known before, but you will see them everywhere from like now. So as I said, the coproduct and product are like two types that can model everything. Basically everything is end of or of something. I'll showcase this later. I'll give you just a sneak peek before uh, Roman's talk. <coughs> how it looks in F-sharp. So just to give you an idea why functional programmers like functional languages, because these things are like first class in them. So this is how you would write the whole thing in F-sharp. It's pretty easy to add these coproducts. And yeah, let's move on. So another topic that is basically totally unrelated to uh, functional programming in, in some way is type safety. So, also, why does it go well? Well, the same thing all over and over. If the function only returns the stuff, you have to tell more, more precisely what it returns. String is not enough. You need a coproduct for like this advanced stuff and things like that. So, let's see. Type safety really brings a lot of uh, benefits. I'll talk about some of them. And one thing is the great domain modeling. So. Let's say you have a class job, which is a state, which is either pending, in progress, or finished. It has some progress, like percentage how far it is, and some result. So what is in result when the job is in pending? Now, I don't know. What is in progress when the job is finished? Probably 100%, but does it make sense to have it there if it's always 100%? The same goes for pending, right? It will be always zero. So why to have it there? So we'll actually refactor that with the coproducts. And what you can do is you can create like a pending job class, which is nothing, it's just pending. Then the in progress job, which has the progress. And then the finished job, which has the result. And you can say that job is either pending or in progress or finished. And when you match over it, you have only the things that make sense on the class accessible. This type of modeling really makes a lot of structures uh, more safe. That if you don't model with coproducts, you have a lot of like uh, invalid states in your uh, application, and you know invalid states are not good because then like bad data is not good because like if it crashes, it's fine on some invalid input, that's like great. You probably will get an email or alert to Slack that it crashed, you will fix it, that's nice. But sometimes it won't crash and it will maybe send something to like some third party system or maybe like a fiscalization, like 
PET or something like that. And fixing that is not great. So we really want this. And if you need some common like uh, data for all of them, you can just abstract that. So you just say that there is a job state that has a pending job, in progress job, finished job, and then the job has a name and the state, and you match mm -hmm. over the state. So this is how we like you model everything through or and and to get your domain model out in the best way possible. And it, it is like really great. Just try it and you'll see that it really solves a lot of problems just on its own. Another thing that type safety bring us, brings us is code duplication. So let's say you have this method, create a uh, date from year, month, and day, and create calendar for a given month. So in order to implement these functions correctly, you should check that the input that was given to you is good, right? So this is probably something that you will do in both of these functions. You will check if it's not a valid month, throw me invalid month exception or argument exception with M. And these are like basically the two same lines in two functions. So what we can do is to actually extract that information to the types itself. So we will create a type called month that is a private constructor so nobody can create it with some invalid data. And you will have like a public static grade that <coughs> checks this. And now you have a guarantee that never ever there will be an invalid month in your code and only this function checks it. You can go even further. This is something that sometimes referred to as a smart constructor. And it's a trade-off. The best way to model month would be to say that it's a co-product of January, February, March, April, and so on. And then you cannot really create it by design. But let's say, for example, email address. To create a precise type that would not allow you to create like in invalid email address on type level, you would spend like a year or so making it. So this is something that will help you. That you just check if it's a valid email and give it to the give it to the class. So the email will be just a wrapper around string. And even there are strings that are not valid email addresses, but all valid email addresses are strings. So you kind of lose on this. But you have this constructor that guarantees you that the string is valid. And like exceptions are not friends with functional program, but we will work on that later. <coughs> and what's also good about this, that it keeps the information in one place. You extracted information to a common place that you have some month, what's the validation for it, and stuff like that. You don't have it like scattered all over the place. Uh, yeah, so now we can refactor those methods to just create take year, month, and day. And the date create method will only take care of what it should. It only should check that the combination of these <laughs> are okay, not that they are standalone okay. That's nice. And another thing is like the honest signature. So if the function only returns a value, it has to communicate well uh, what it really returns. So what does, it function, what does this function do if there is no person in the database? There are multiple, multiple solutions to it. From what I've seen, it can throw in an exception, person is not found, it can let them now. That's like, you also have to look at the implementation or documentation or the comment itself or try it or something like that. That's not good. So, with this type we'll introduce, it's called option. It says on the type level that the thing itself can be now. So with the C-sharp 8, they have introduced uh, like nullable reference types. So you could use that here. 
but I'll talk more about why option is much better than the reference types. And so now on the type level, you have that it returns an option of a person. And the compiler won't let you <coughs> handle both cases. It won't give you the value. The get value is wrapped within this like container of option. And you have to really match both cases that what if it is not there, what if it's there, what I have to do. And uh, I also added GUID as a string, but that's basically from the previous slides. And this demonstrates something that's like really a, like a powerful concept in functional programming, the concept of a caller over callee. That you as a callee should not decide how things should go. You should just return information to the caller and he should be the one who decides. And it perfectly made sense, right? So if you have a function like this, for example, and you call it from a web like API, you will probably say that if the person is there, I will serialize it to JSON or return it to the caller. If the person is not there, you will probably just return 404 or something. But if you call this, for example, from some scheduled jobs or a queue, you want to say something else. You maybe want to crash if there is no person for this ID because it's a configuration of the job. You want to say to the developer it's invalid. So the caller should decide what should really happen, not the callee. Just give as much as information to the caller and he knows what to do. And it makes the code much more readable that you in the caller side know what's happening. You don't have to look inside the function because it only returns a value and you know the type. So, and this even goes to an extent that some like signatures of a function have just a single possible implementation. So it's not only just that you see what it returns, you even know the implementation just based on the type signature. And if you think about what type really is, it's basically a set of values, right? So, like an integer has a lot of them, uh, but Boolean has only two, it's true or false. So it's basically a set of values, and that gets you thinking, what about like a set with only one value, what it is? So that's, something, that's some type that is called unit, and it only has one value. It's basically an enum with only just one case. And why is it useful? Well, you have probably seen that in .NET we have these overloads like func of A and func without anything, or like the action, uh, that we have func and action. Why do we have like two things expressing the same thing? Then also task of T and task. It means the same thing, but there are two types describing it. So actually what task is, that's a task of unit. It returns something, it's just not useful. So this gives you the ability not to write like these non-generic and generic types for everything. You can just use unit to indicate it. So action integer is actually action from function from unit to int. It does not take anything useful as a parameter, but it takes something. Or the action itself, it's like from unit to unit. It does not do anything special. Actually, it doesn't do anything. If the function is pure, and it's from unit to unit, it really does nothing. And that's, uh, that's also where we can like infer the implementation. For example, every function that has a written value unit basically does nothing. It only throws away an input. It's like one function, it's called unit. It takes whatever type and returns unit, just throws it away. And there is one more special type because unit had one value. What if there are no values? That's called nothing or void, like other void than we are used to in C-sharp. And that type cannot be created by default, like by the, by the design. You cannot really create the value, so what is it used for? You can, for example, indicate, you probably have some function, we call it contract fail or something like that, that you basically want to throw an exception with some things and it returns a void, but it does not return a void. It will actually never return anything. So that's where you could use 
Like for this function foo, which only throws an exception, you would return a nothing because you indicate to the caller that this, like this is the end of the program. Or if I would have there like while true, I will also should return nothing because it, it will never end. This is unfortunately not supported, like it's semantic, it's not supported by C sharp. So for example, if I would create a coproduct of A and nothing, <coughs> I would still have to handle the nothing case in the match, even though I know it won't be ever triggered. Time. Okay. So let's dig in some types that are really popular within functional programming and are implemented in Functchart, language extensions, F sharp based class library, and stuff like that. One of them is option. So let's say you have this piece of code. You want to do something like uh, you have an allowable input, some divider, you want to add five, then divided by uh, the divider, if the divider is zero, you return to the you return the answer to the universe itself and everything, and otherwise you divide it. So this code, like at least in my eyes, seems really noisy. I wouldn't get the idea what it's trying to do in even large scale. I'm just presenting like a small example, but in large scale this is like really weird. And we can also forget to check for zero, right? So it does not force us to do it. We can check, we can forget to check for null and everything. So the other possible way would be to make the code like cleaner, to extract every like error handling before that to really uh, accept the preconditions and then do everything. From these functions, it's at least clear what it's trying to do. It wants to do like what's on line eight and it has to like handle all these cases before. But again, you can forget that these cases like exist and what if you this is just addition and division, so it probably won't be like extended in future. But if those are some other functions, what if they return like new type of error? What there is a new exception that you add? You would actually need to go all over the color faces in order to make sure that it's handled correctly and extended. You will probably forget, and that's what we do usually. So this is also not nice. And it also duplicates the code. Let's say that like you have some validation in the, uh, like you want to do this from many places and the plus is also some business method. You have to do these checks before the business method or all the places. So it duplicates the code, so it's not nice. So how to improve this code with option, for example, option is basically an allowable type, let's say. Uh, it's uh, a coproduct of T, like, everything and a unit. The unit tells that nothing like, it tells us that the variant of the coproduct can be created, but it has nothing useful to it. So it basically showcases that uh, it's now, kind of, or it's the thing inside. Uh, one, one thing you can do with this, you can nest it. You cannot nest nullable. You cannot have like person, question mark, question mark but you can have like option of option and stuff like that. So now what we can do, we can have the division which returns an option of an integer because division is not something it's, which is called total function. It does not have an output for every input. So you like encode it in the types in a way that it returns an option. So now the function is total. For every input, it has some output. For the ones it did not have, which means b is zero, it returns the unit in the coproduct, otherwise the result. So we like, so you say, here we use the match as kind of a switch, so we are like, if b is zero, then return an empty option, that I don't have things to do for this. If it's not, I can create an option for the result. Now you can never forget to handle the zero. In the call place, you always have to handle zero case. But writing these matches over the code would be also a bit messy. So we have some functions to deal with that. And this is what it would actually look like. So you first just, you have the input and you add five. <coughs> then you divide it. And if, if it went wrong, 
Return from Tifu, 42. So you probably don't know what these map and flip map do. They are a way how to make it uh, like work. I'll explain it in the next slide. And you can never ever forget. That's like great. You have it encoded in the types and everything. And you have seen it already. The map is actually like another name for select function. And flat map is another name for select many functions. So let's imagine an enumerable instead of the option. You would do the same thing, right? You would have the input. And you would select like a two five to everything inside the enumerable. And then you have some app which returns also the enumerable for the things in the original one. So you would select many to flat it, right? There's the same thing the map and flat map does for option. You can view option as an enumerable of zero on, or one element. And it works the same way. So yeah, this is something already built in. And these select and a select many are so common pattern. It's known with like a really like scary word in functional programming. I won't talk about it. But that's why the link queue notation is so functional. You can use link queue for every like type that has the select and select many stuff like this in the following manner. That if you want, if you have two options of integer and you want to add them, that's like the second line. You might view it as readable, you might not. Uh, but with like a lot of these flat maps and maps, it can get uh, a bit messy. Uh, but it's also OK. But the link you can help you to refactor it like this. Imagine basically a var <coughs> keyword instead of the from. Imagine a return instead of the select. And imagine equals instead of in. So you have like value A is equal to something inside of A. Value B is equal to something in B. And then you just add them. And the return value is option of it. So you basically like leave the function to the world of like inside boxes. And yeah, that, that's pretty useful. So another topic where another type will help us is error handling. And I've already touched this with the option. So let's say you have a sign up function, which takes credentials, returns an account. You have create sign up email, which takes an account and it's an email. So sign up is probably not a total function, right? Because for inputs that are already in database, we want to return something <laughs> that the account already exists. For like credentials that are not valid, you want to throw something like invalid email exception. You don't have to if you have correctly implemented the credentials that they are already OK. Uh, but the main topic I want to speak about here is like the error handling of those business functions. So this is like a typical way you would probably do that, that you catch the exception that the account already exists and do something. Or there is an invalid email exception, and then you do something. And again, if there is another exception, you have to go all over the code base to check that every caller handles this exception, which is something that you will probably forget. And as we already said in earlier, the track catch is a statement, so we can really compose it uh, to our world structure. So we will use something that's called try. And it's basically coproduct of two, which means that if it's like, it's usually also called either. It's like either left or right. So it's either a success of something or an error of something. Then you can create this great type, like sign up error, where you list everything that can go wrong. It's like account already exists, invalid my password too short, even no connection. That if you want to handle that some third party is not available, you can add it there too. And then the sign up returns I try of account and a sign up error. So it's like it's either an account, everything was okay, or it's some of these errors. And if you need to add some data to the errors, like you do, for example, sometimes to exceptions, you can make the you can make the sign up error also a co-product of 
these like uh, cases. But in C sharp, it's uh, usually convenient. You don't really need the data often to have it as an enum. Now you have like nicely encoded in the signature of the method what it really does, and you cannot forget not to handle the errors. So you have the sign up, and then you again do the select. Imagine like try as an enumerable again, kinda. You can do the map, which will basically says if it was success, do this on the account. And the return value to email will be I try of email or the sign up error. So now we cannot forget. If we add a new uh, error, we have to handle it. In all like the places in our code base, it won't compile. It really nicely documents what can go wrong. If I would ask, if I would come like to your company and view your code base, and I would point to some business function, and I would ask you what can go wrong, well, I think it would take you some time to really tell me what could go wrong. And the problem is that with like large systems, there are tens of these errors that can occur in business, uh, like some function, and then you won't handle them when writing the code. When you go to some completely new code you have never seen before, and you want to implement something, you really need to go all over the code base and see what it does, what you call, in order to like know about these edge cases and everything. Here, you don't have to. You just like handle all the errors. And this is more like a real world example. Let's say that even the create sign up email may fail, but with some another error. It has some email error and a sign up error. So what you usually then do is to create some common error on your layer, because even with exceptions you should do that. If you have a function which is internally implemented in a way that it touches the file system, and the file system throws a like file not file exception, you should definitely not like let the caller know that a file was sound. You should catch that and throw a new exception that says something like more meaningful to the level of your function. So this is the same thing you do, same thing you do here. <coughs> you can create a common error, which is like a co-product of sign-up error or email error. And then you can uh, like just map it to create a common error. You basically say uh, map error, which you transform the error to a new error, and then you use the flat map to compose these try together as well with the enumerables. This stuff with map and flat map, it takes a while to like really be confident in writing it. So that's something I cannot really give you in an hour or so talk. You'll have to like try it hands on. But someday it will click and you will like be totally confident in writing this error handling. And like one of like uh, yeah, so if you if you prefer it like uh, a less strict variant that you don't want to start like this is a pretty huge change to the code base right so what you can start doing is using this weekly type variant which is just an i try which basically has an exception in the other so you can just transform the exception handling to this like type level and then you can transform the exceptions to strongly <coughs> typed errors. <coughs> Validation. Uh, so when you are implementing an API or everything that takes some user input, you have to validate the input is right. And this is some way to do it, I guess. Uh, that you, you, The main thing about validation is you don't want to only return one error, you want to return everything that went wrong. <coughs> So you have like list of exceptions, and you are like, if name is wrong, add it to exceptions. Uh, if email is wrong, add it to exceptions. And then you are like, are there any exceptions? No. Then you can create a person. Otherwise, you create some, let's say, aggregate exception with everything. Uh, there is a better way to do this. The duplicate, it is the same problems I've talked about earlier, it duplicates logic, <coughs> it's messy, it's mutating the list and everything. So what's the better way? 
using the eye trial. Uh, that's why the eye trial in the previous example had like the enumerable of errors, exceptions. What you can do is, let's say you have this, like one function which says create email and it only handles, like it gives you errors that went wrong with the email or it gives you an email. They have the create name. I listed a simple implementation for the create name. Like now, the name is now empty, then it's error. Otherwise, it's success. Uh, and then you can use a function which is really useful. That's called try aggregate, where you give it a, like a list of these tries. And if all of them are OK, it will call the function on the last line. If not, it will aggregate all the errors to single array and, result, and give you it on the return value. So then you compose these small functions to like one large one, which does the validation. This is like really great. I already used basically a method that had, I don't know, 15 lines of code to six or even five. That's pretty nice. So let's like sum it up together and see some like example which you would see in a real world code. Let's say you have a function that gets the person from the database, then it does something. This is something that you would typically see that it gets the person by ID from database, checks for now, for example, and then it returns HTTP not found the exception. Then it tries to do something, catches some exception, returns bad request, for example, on okay if everything was okay. So this has all the problems we have talked about during the talk. So let's change it with everything together. And this is like the more functional example. You have seen that it's, the slide is now more concise. That's like a great uh, side effect of functional code. You typically write less code. From what I've heard, uh, I've never really rewrote like a whole project from scratch to functional, but from people who did, they managed to scratch down like half a million of code in C sharp to let's say, I think it was 130,000 uh, lines in F sharp or something like that. So it really makes your code shorter. And this is the, you know, so in our new functional code, we don't have like the person written nothing, we have the option. Then it, it does something, but it does not return anything. It returns a unit. Actually, I try a unit when there is an exception. And then you get the person and you are forced to handle the case when it went wrong. So you map over it like if everything went fine, I will deal with errors later, do something. And the result is like the option of I try of unit. And you have to handle all the cases. It won't compile otherwise. So you must say like if there is some person then you can match on the, like the execution. If it was success, I written OK. If it was an error, I written bad request, for example. And if the person was not found in the first place, you just written HTTP not found. And so the big question is, like throughout the talk, I've talked about concept that you can slowly introduce like on a function level in your, in your code base. And there is this question that probably most of you have. I said that we have pure functions, but we do have databases and stuff like that. We need functions to perform I.O. So how do you handle this? Well, a single problem with FP is that like handling I.O. and the system architecture from like top to bottom is pretty advanced. It's not the first thing you should learn. And that's why like hello world in Haskell is not a good like starting point because it performs, or performs an IO. So, uh, but I want to like, give you at least an idea of how it's done in the big picture. Because usually people are like, okay, I know how to make pure functions. I know how to do it type safely. But what if I, I need to go to the database to actually fetch the person? So, we will have side effects. We need to have side effects, but we want to limit them. We want to have them on like as minimum places as possible. We want to have as much of the 
code base purely functional as possible. And like a simple way how to do it is this unpure, pure, unpure sandwich, let's say. That you basically fetch the data at the beginning, you run it to your pure code, and then you save the result. This seems nice and it's applicable, it, but it's not always a great idea. It has some uh, like uh, limitations, let's say. One of the limitations is that nothing forces you to do so. You can happily do it inside a function. So that's why you would create this IO type, which is basically just a type indicating that a given function return like touches database or does something to the outer world. And then you it won't allow you to access the uh, data easily. You are basically forced to work this with this IO. And if you see that your IO is somewhere near, like deep in your business logic, you know you are doing something wrong. Because then you let the IO like, scatter to your code base. You don't want to do it. The good thing is that the IO has the same properties as the option I try enumerable. It fix, fits in link queue. So you can be like, let's say the get repository takes an environment. It there is no dependency on like class level. There are no classes basically. So it has to take the environment as an input and returns a recipe. So this is like pretty nice to make the IO explicit at least. Uh, but it should be as high as possible in the code, like really at the transaction level, not in the business layer. Uh, and the great thing also is that the caller knows about the function being not pure. He knows that this function will perform IO. He knows that he should be like uh, taken with care. I don't know, this is the time. And in the previous example, you see the environment world a lot, and we don't want there, we want to polish it a bit. This is like advanced. You don't have to like get it. This is not the uh, reason I made this talk. You have already seen everything important. This is like really just to get you started after you uh, understand everything I've talked before. Then you can apply this reader thing which, as you see, made the environment world, uh, world disappear from the code, which is nice. You don't have to pass it all away. The code is cleaner. And you have it nicely in the signature uh, of the get recipe that it like somewhat, somewhat needs environment and returns a recipe. The reader is basically an alias for a function, but uh, it's, uh, this is not even in functsharp. This is something which is implemented by the language extensions in a separate package called C Sharp Monad. Monad is the word, weird word I didn't want to talk about. And it will polish the code, <coughs> but it's not enough. <coughs> Usually, when you do like a functional application from top to bottom, you want to embrace something that's called effect library. So you essentially like kind of abstract over effect. And what's great about it is that you don't really care what the effect is. It can be basically asynchronous, it can be an IO, it can be anything, and you can compose it to simple effect and abstract over it. So when introducing async await uh, in C Sharp, there was this like, it's super great, you just add async await in your code and it's asynchronous. So I have this kind of bus uh, like advertisement for FX library. You don't have to do anything to make it <coughs> asynchronous. You just need the effect to be asynchronous, which you do in single place. So that's pretty great. Then let's say the effect <coughs> library has the IO, but this is more advanced IO. The IO I showed previously was like just a simple wrapper. This is a really complex IO. And it's basically a reader with some stuff in it. This is nicely implemented in Scala in a library called Zio. Is anybody here who knows about Zio? No? A little bit. Uh, so that's like a really good representation of effect library. And the great thing is that then the method looks something like this. You have the IO of some environment where you say that the environment is like recipe provider and user provider. 
and you return something and you like compose it like this and uh, the, good, the good thing is that the get, get recipe has this same signature but it only requires a recipe provider and the do something only requires user provider and then you compose it here the downside of C sharp is that you have to state it explicitly with the where clause in languages like F sharp this is automatically inferred for you so you'll even notice it so you basically get for free like this really narrow dependency injection kind of that you only require what you really want in the environment and the environment is basically everything un unpure so you would have like the providers or repositories you would have the daytime random generator and stuff like that and then in the test you have some test environment which for random numbers returns a constant for daytime returns the same time for example and stuff like that you don't have to mock anything just the environment there is also an alternative way to this like effect based on reader and it's called free monad and basically the oh i have a bug in the <laughs> slide sorry uh, basically the idea is that these pieces that make some like effect to the outside world should be uh, described by a value so let's say you have like a get recipe and it's a value that says it is and the return value of your whole program is basically just an execution tree with some unfilled points and then you interpret it in the in the caller like that the caller will provide these holes in your execution tree so instead of like making a test in a test environment you do a test interpreter for example it's really similar in a way what it does to your program but it's somewhat different the code example here says yeah the code example sucks <laughs> Uh, but it basically returns either instead of IO of recipe, like IO of environmental recipe, it returns a program of recipe and the interpreter knows the program pieces. Uh, yeah, these are some links. So that's basically everything. We have like 10 minutes, so I guess if you have any questions, now is the right time. Yeah. Debugging. Uh, well, to be honest, debugging is well. There is no really some correlation between like debugging and functional programming, like how it behaves. But it usually is harder to debug your program a bit. But uh, if you write program in a way that it does not do crazy stuff. So for example, debugging is really hard with something called point-free programming. That's a programming where you don't explicitly uh, like show the arguments in the, in the function. You just compose these functions together. So you don't even see the arguments. So having a breakpoint there is like weird because you don't see the arguments and everything. But that's also a bit why Point three programming is known as pointless programming because it's usually such a mess that people don't do it. But I've written a great amount of, well, some amount of like functional code, especially in F sharp, like production code, and I had no problem with debugging. You can usually, what you can do is to like in the worst case, change the code a bit to really see what you want. But usually like uh, some immediate window will serve for that. So I think the debugging is pretty okay. Especially with, I don't know how Visual Studio, but Rider can give you a breakpoint to Lambda. So, which is really useful that uh, you can really have a breakpoint in the Lambda, which basically solves a lot of issues. Without that, it might be a bit trickier. Does it answer your question? Okay. Any other? Yeah? Uh, what is your opinion when you are implementing some standard, uh, like you said, 
uh, that the caller should be responsible for providing some options to the function. But when you implement something that, when it's defined directly what should be returned, uh, how should be handled like this? Uh, I don't this. think I understand the question. You mean like if you implement it by standard, you mean like some RFC or? Like, for example, if you know JSON API, like, okay. like the extension of REST, REST API, okay. so, so uh, it, it is done. It is done like what, what should be returned, so you, you don't have to. <coughs> Some options. So, do you mean like interpretability with some existing code that does not well, takes options and stuff like that? Yes. Okay. So usually what you have to do is to create some wrappers around the code to make it like functional like. Uh, it's true that most of the .NET libraries are not functional. Uh, so you have to create a wrapper that will make them functional. But there are many things that will convert your options uh, to another type. There is a function called get or now on option, and it will convert it to another type. There is a function called get on try, which will throw the exception inside if it's exception. If it's not, it will return. So in function, there are these methods. Yeah, that's probably something I forgot to mention that uh, when you will be rolling out, you will come to these like points where it's object oriented and functional on the other side you have to like convert it there are functions in function that will provide you with that that will convert the get like the i try to a classic exception it will convert the option to another type and stuff like that if that's what answers your yeah. question yeah. so what's about the uh, logging uh, if you if you want to log something uh, it's a side effect and you, you Good question. So, what is a side effect? Actually, if you have a function which returns the same in uh, like output for given input, there is this function in C sharp called reference equals. If you call the function twice, you have two persons, and you call reference equals on them, it returns false. It will tell you that the persons are not the same, basically, because they lie on the different uh, places in memory. This is like the extreme way to view side effects. So basically, it's up to you to define what side effect is for you. So what you can do, and it's totally fine, is to have logging, which is mutable in pure functions, because it will not affect the business in any way. So I would actually not do like the logging in a functional way. I would just log it uh, in most cases. But there are, of course, a way. They are a bit advanced how to do logging in a FP way. Basically, there is this uh, type called writer. And as the reader allowed us to remove the environment as an argument, the writer can do something like remove the return type or part of the return type. So your function can return the logs, but you don't see it anywhere, just on the top level where you're like, OK, log everything that was returned. Yeah. How does it work with OIDA? How does it? Oh, yeah. So, uh, I really don't like OIDAs. <laughs> uh, the thing is that I guess everybody wrote your head entity framework. They have this great function called detect changes and save changes. It's like, hey, everybody, let's go to database. And it's really, really anti functional, like in a super way. <laughs> But what you can do, like the main problem with ORM is that they, will mutable, they deal with mutable data. And you don't have mutable data. But what you can do is when you have your application structured in a way that only returns something, in the top level, you can have from beginning the ORML, ORMM, which will like retrieve the data to the, from the database, set the immutable values to it, and save it to the database. But just at the top level. Then your whole application is immutable. But uh, like just the top is mutable because the database is mutable anyway. Unless you go for like databases designed for immutable data, it's mutable anyway. So you can use the RMR just but in a really small fashion. 
but some like intermediate step that you could do that we actually have is that you can have a single place in our application that changes things. We then you have something we call like update, which describes your request to update things. So for example, person, you would have a person update, which is a person and a name. And you are like, I want this person to have this name. And by, for example, some internal uh, stuff you can enforce just to have the single place where you update it. And then you force, like the update parameter or the update is immutable. So you force most of the application to return these updates and then just a single place basically evaluate the update. And it's really great, like this really enables a lot of stuff. You have a single place to check for every like uh, changes and stuff like that. You can remove basically tracker from, like the use of tracker from entity framework because you know when things are changed. You have the diff, you don't need to call change tracker track, uh, detect changes and see what was changed. You know it because you have the unchanged entity and then the parameters that want to change it. So before you do it, you can do these diffs and everything. So this is like intermediate to, towards immutable data, data and then you can push it all the way and have the ORM and just in a single function really, really away. And like if you really go all the way, you can remove the ORM. ORM. Does it answer your question? Okay, I guess not. <laughs> uh, what's, is there something precise that you are worried about? Like, or you don't really can, cannot imagine the use of it? <laughs> Yeah, you, 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 well, the first thing you should separate your entities from things that are safe to database, right? Because ORM, ORM, ORM cannot map like coproducts to database, right? So that's the best practice even if you don't use FP. Like having entity is the same thing like modeling domain and as a like row in a table that's like just awful and you need to separate that. And then you basically, as I said, you have like the pure, unpure pure sandwich. So in the unpure, you get the data, you map it to the domain, you do the domain logic, and then you map it to the some external stuff. Then it's really, really easy to change that. So for example, I'm developing a sharp application for recommendation, and I have changed the database four times already. And it took me like 30 minutes to change it four times because the domain logic stays the same. I just changed the mapping methods, and it was everything. Does that answer? We can even take this offline, you can ask me. I can. Any other question? I guess no, so thank you for listening. Thank you.